There's a reason why all these forensic reconstructions end up looking like humans, and it's got nothing to do with science. I think it's about anthropomorphism. That's our tendency to attribute human characteristics to other animals. It seems to be part of human nature. We assume that because we've got smooth skin, protruding noses, clear eye whites and full lips, then Neanderthals did too. And just because we lost our body hair, we assume they did as well. You can see examples of this anthropomorphic bias in television documentaries and in museum reconstructions around the world. The men are sometimes shown as quite handsome, and often they're even clean shaven. The children are nearly always quite cute, and some of them amazingly even wear diapers. The females occasionally sport trendy tattoos, and they always have breasts, even though not one of the species of primate has permanently protuberant breasts. So you're just left with the impression that we're seriously projecting our own tastes and values onto Neanderthals. Quite apart from the anthropomorphic problem, there's also a fundamental flaw in the technique used to reconstruct Neanderthal faces from their skulls. Now this forensic process works fine on humans, but that's because we know the shape and position of our noses, ears and lips, we know the thickness and texture of our skin, and we know the shape and size of our eyeballs. These soft tissue features are unique to humans. You would never use them to reconstruct the face of a chimpanzee or gorilla. And yet, scientists always use human facial characteristics and dimensions to reconstruct Neanderthal faces. So it's inevitable that you end up with something that looks like a human. It's spurious science. Television documentaries often use actors to portray Neanderthals. This involves hours and hours of meticulous makeup, which the producers assure us is 100% anatomically accurate. But it's not. And one reason is that Neanderthal eyes were in a different position in their skulls compared to humans. They were higher up, about where our foreheads are. Which raises an interesting question. What did they look like? Actually, once you get rid of all the anthropomorphic bias and the inherent flaws in the reconstruction technology, answering this question is not particularly difficult. And that's because, ultimately, Neanderthals were members of the order of primates. They were primates. Once you acknowledge that Neanderthals were primates, you start to see similarities between them and other primates. For example, when I compared the profile of a Neanderthal with a chimpanzee, they seem to fit amazingly well. For my book, Them and Us, I commissioned one of the world's best digital sculptors to create a completely new forensic reconstruction based on my theories. We began by scanning the skull of a French Neanderthal. Then, over several months and hundreds of emails and phone calls between Spain and Australia, a creature gradually emerged. Now, saying that Neanderthals look like modern primates is an interesting clue, but it only goes so far. That's because modern primates come in all shapes and sizes. And there's a good reason for that. They've simply adapted to very specific regional, ecological and environmental circumstances. And we would expect the same of Neanderthals. So to create a more nuanced picture of Neanderthal physiology, we need to understand the specifics of their environment. And we know a great deal about that. It was Ice Age Europe, a frozen glacial wasteland, described as the most inhospitable environment ever occupied by hominids. This was the environment that shaped every aspect of their physiology and behaviour. Take the issue of body hair, for example. Were Neanderthals hairless like us? Or did they have body hair like all the other primates? Well, if you look at the animals that lived in Ice Age Europe at the same time as Neanderthals, you see that they all had thick, dense coats of body hair. 
the mammoth, the woolly rhino, the Eurasian cave lion, the cave bear, all had thick fur coats. And that makes sense as an ecological adaptation to the climate. So it makes sense that Neanderthals did too. In Ice Age Europe, where Neanderthals evolved, there were only about five or six edible plants. And those that did grow there were of such low nutritional value, they weren't worth the time and effort to harvest. This, I believe, forced Neanderthals to abandon their ancestral omnivore eat-anything diet that they acquired from Africa and adopt an exclusive carnivorous diet. In other words, they stopped being hunter-gatherers and became exclusive hunters. But this is where it gets interesting. The prey they were forced to hunt included some of the fiercest, largest and certainly most dangerous animals on Earth. These animals raised the bar and forced Neanderthals to become adept hunters. My contention is that this transformed them over half a million years into the apex predator of Europe. My theory that Neanderthals were flesh-eating predators is supported by new molecular analysis of their teeth enamel. This reveals that the Neanderthal diet consisted of 99% meat. In fact, that's all they ate. And there's only one way to get that much fresh meat, and that's by hunting. It also seems that they didn't care where the meat came from. That's because we now know that Neanderthals were cannibals. The first evidence of this actually surfaced in 1906. Since then, literally hundreds of bones have been discovered right across Europe, bearing the unmistakable cut marks of cannibalism. My predator theory also explains why Neanderthals were so much stronger than humans. Their muscles were so large, they had to have extra thick bones to take the strain. It's been estimated that Neanderthals were six times stronger than humans. Even a Neanderthal child could toss a human adult around like a rag doll. It also explains their extraordinary intelligence. Neanderthals were unquestionably the smartest animal in Europe at the time. They mastered fire making, they constructed windbreaks, they made tools and weapons, including razor-sharp thrusting spears. And like other social predators, they hunted in packs and used sophisticated ambush tactics to maximize capture rates. But there's one last adaptation that helped transform Neanderthals into such a formidable killing machine. The dark. The vast majority of land-based predators hunt at night because it's easier to catch prey when they're resting or asleep. This theory predicts that Neanderthals acquired larger night vision eyes and pupils to see in the dark. These kinds of eyes reflect light extremely efficiently. It would explain why Neanderthals had such enormous eye sockets. If you think my Neanderthal reconstruction pictures are a bit scary, or the idea of camping alone at night out here in the forest is a bit disconcerting. There's a good reason for that, and it goes to the heart of my Neanderthal predation theory. That's because about 100,000 years ago, a group of European Neanderthals migrated into the Middle East, into an area currently occupied by Israel, Syria, Jordan and Lebanon. Now living there at the time was a group of ancestral humans. These were timid Stone Age hominids who moved up from Africa. And the evidence suggests that the Neanderthals began hunting them. But not just for food. I believe that Neanderthal males also began hunting human females for sex. Now this horrific period of sexual and cannibalistic predation went on for in excess of 50,000 years. My research indicates that the only humans to survive were those born with modern human adaptations. Things like high intelligence, creativity, language, and aggression. This allowed them to turn the tables on the Neanderthals. 
For the next 20,000 years, they hunted them to extinction. So the basic premise of my book is that everything we are today, everything that defines us as humans, is the result of that extraordinary 70,000 year conflict between them and us. It's what made us humans. I'm Danny Bindramini. Thanks for watching. Check out the website.